Hello, this is Pat Hindle, editor at Microwave Journal. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on material and PCB fabrication considerations for the different bands of 5G, presented by John Coonrod, Technical Marketing Manager of Rogers Corporation Advanced Connectivity Solutions. Before we begin the presentation, let me cover a few items of the about the on 24 webinar platform. In the center of the screen, you will see a window containing the presentation. You may enlarge this to full screen to have a better view of the slides. The window on your screen labeled resource list contains a copy of the presentation, which you can download at any time. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay within about an hour from when we conclude, allowing you to watch it again and recommend to colleagues who are not able to join this live event. You will find a link to the recording in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. If you have technical problems, please click on the yellow box with the question mark at the bottom of your screen. It will take you to a helpful user's guide. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. If you would like to ask a question, just type it into the Q&A box on your screen at any time. 5G technology is different from previous communication infrastructures, and one noteworthy characteristic is that 5G will use multiple bands of frequency for its applications. On the surface of different bands of frequency may not appear to be significant. However, the choice of high frequency materials and PCB fabrication considerations can be very different for applications at significantly different frequencies. Additionally, some PCB constructions for 5G are more complicated than PCBs that were used in earlier communication systems. Furthermore, the potential for demanding thermal management issues with 5G appears to be a big concern. This webinar will address the different considerations for specifying the proper high-frequency materials to be used for PCBs and 5G applications, which are operating at different frequency bands. It will also give RF performance comparisons of these different materials, as well as address multiple issues associated with PCB fabrication and thermal management. At this point, I'd like to introduce today's presenter. John Coonrad is Technical Marketing Manager for Rogers Corporation, Advanced Connectivity Solutions Division. John has 30 years of experience in printed circuit board industry. About half of this time was spent in the flexible printed circuit board industry regarding circuit design, applications, processing, and materials engineering. The past 15 years have been spent supporting high-frequency circuit materials involving circuit fabrication, providing application support, and conducting electrical characterization studies. John is chair for the IPC D24C High Frequency Test Methods Task Group and holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Arizona State University. So at this point, I will turn it over to John. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, all, and uh, we appreciate your attendance. Today we're going to be talking about high-frequency materials, also PCB, printed circuit board, fabrication considerations for the different bands at 5G. The agenda that I plan on following is shown here. Uh, going to be basically throughout the entire presentation, I'm really breaking this up into two categories of uh, two different bands, so sub-6 gigahertz and then millimeter wave. And we'll talk a fair amount about uh, the materials being uh, specified for these different applications and why. And then also I'm going to spend a good amount of time talking about thermal management because that comes into play as well. So that's what I plan on following today. Uh, to start with, maybe just go through a very simple slide here as kind of a, a thought process before we get into the more details. And, and really between these two different bands, uh, sub-6 gigahertz and millimeter wave, and again, for millimeter wave, though, I'm really looking at specifically 28 gigahertz to 39 gigahertz. There are, are other frequencies at millimeter wave being used for 5G. Uh, and most of the things I'm going to be talking about today at uh, 28 to 39 gigahertz is also going to apply to those higher frequencies as well. So anyway, that's the two categories I'm really going to be talking about. And uh, just going down a list of a few things to think about, substrate thickness. Uh, the sub-6 gigahertz applications are typically thicker, so 20 mil, 30 mil is what, we're, what we've been seeing recently being specified. And then millimeter wave is thinner, uh, usually 5 to 10 mil depending on things. Dielectric constant that's being specified uh, for materials is usually around 3 to 3.5, sometimes as high as 3.7. Dispatient factor for the sub-6 gigahertz 
is uh, usually a low loss material, less than 0 0.004, and millimeter wave is more sensitive to losses, of course, and uh, there the material being used is uh, even lower loss, usually less than 0 0.002 for dissipation factor. Copper surface roughness at 6 gigahertz, uh, that can be an issue, uh, depending on a lot of things, it can be a significant issue, but a millimeter wave, it's definitely an issue and needs to be considered, so we're going to talk about that some today as well. And then thermal conductivity, um, for both of these bands, I would say that you want something thermally conductive, and again, depending on exactly what you're doing, sometimes it needs to be even better than this, but just kind of a general rule of thumb, um, what I normally consider to be good for thermal conductivity is 0.5 watts per meter K or higher. And uh, the majority of the circuits that we're seeing right now for uh, 5G on either one of these bands are multilayer. In fact, every stack up I've seen has been a multilayer. And uh, a lot of these are actually hybrids. And hybrids, um, what I mean by that, basically it's a multilayer using dissimilar materials. And uh, that's done purposely for a lot of different reasons, actually. And we'll get into that as we go along. So first off, talk about substrate thickness. Uh, as most of you probably know, I'm betting. Uh, at lower frequencies, uh, thicker substrates are typically used. And uh, higher frequencies, usually thinner. And when you get to the millimeter wave range of frequencies, these thinner substrates are normally uh, necessary uh, to really avoid unwanted resonances, various wave mode propagation, and excessive radiation. And insertion loss can be pretty important for uh, most of the 5G applications, probably all of them. And um, insertion loss is substrate thickness dependent. There are several dependencies for insertion loss, but substrate thickness dependent is one of them. And this slide and the next couple of slides, I'm just going to go through a quick overview of insertion loss just so we're all on the same page. And also to get a good understanding of the difference of the thick uh, circuits and the thin circuits for the different bands at 5G and why you need to think about that a little different for what you're doing with materials. Uh, so anyway, uh, a thinner circuit <clears throat> is typically more dominated by the conductor loss or conductor effects, and thicker circuits more dominated by the dielectric loss. And I've shown a simple equation here for insertion loss, and that's made up of four components, conductor loss, dielectric loss, radiation loss, and leakage loss. I'm not going to talk about leakage loss today. Uh, usually, due to very high volume resistivity with our materials, leakage loss is uh, normally not an issue. It can be an issue, but what we're talking about today, it's really not coming into play. So I'm not going to really talk about leakage loss. And the same thing with radiation loss. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today because most of the data I'm going to be showing is uh, either radiation loss is very minimal effect or no effect. Uh, but radiation loss is a huge topic by itself. I've got an entire presentation on that if anyone's interested. So really today I'm going to focus more on the two components of insertion loss that are conductor loss and dielectric losses. And uh, I've uh, shown this presentation several times before, so anyone that's sat through my presentations, I apologize for being repetitive, but it just seems a good visual way to think about this stuff. So uh, really what I did is uh, this is a study where I used three different sets of circuits. I'm using microstrip transmission lines, short and long, in physical length to do a differential length method. And what I did was use the same material. It's all RO4350B laminates. Uh, same copper, same everything. The only difference is these circuits um, are a different thickness. So the chart on the left are showing the performance of circuits based on 6.6 .6 mil thick. The chart in the middle is uh, based on results from 10 mil thick, and 30 mil thick is the chart on the right. So we'll start with the chart in the middle since it's got the uh, legend. And the thick purple curve is the measured data. And we're going up to about 20 gigahertz in this case, and you can see we get about a 0.7 dB per inch loss on this material and using 50 ohm microscript transmission lines here. And I'm also showing on this graph the um, output from MWI 2018. It's a software that is uh, free for download on our website, our Rogers Technology Support Hub. And the nice thing about that software is it does break out the different components of losses, so it shows me the total insertion loss, what it should be, and that's the green curve. And that matches the measured loss you know, pretty close, close enough for what we're doing today anyway. And then it also shows us uh, dielectric losses, blue curve, conductor losses, red curve. And in the case of the 10 mil thick circuits in the middle chart here, they have more conductor losses than dielectric losses. And then with that same thought, moving to the chart to the left, again, 50 ohm microstrip transmission lines except thinner, 6.6 .6 mil thick. And to maintain 50 ohms, you're going to have a more narrow conductor. More narrow conductor means higher current density, more, more conductor loss, basically. 
And you can see what happens with the red curve, which is the conductor loss. It shifts down. It causes a lot more loss. So basically, a thinner circuit is more sensitive to conductor effects. That's true for conductor losses, and it's also true for phase response that a thinner circuit is more sensitive to the conductor effects. And then on the opposite side, the chart on the right, that is the same materials again except thicker. So this is 30 mils thick, adjusted the conductor width to maintain 50 ohms, and now the red curve, the conductor loss, is not the major factor. It's actually the blue curve, which is dielectric losses. And dielectric losses are mostly associated with, in material sense anyway, uh, dissipation factor. So just kind of a quick thought process that goes along with this. So we have an application at 6.6 mil thick, the chart on the left, and uh, somebody is uh, trying to get a little better loss, what they may do is, um, you know, take a look at that and think, well, what I need to do is really affect the conductor. And what you can do, instead of using 4350B, you can use 4350B low pro. And that low pro is a low profile copper. And we know low profile copper or smooth copper will have less conductor losses. And then that red curve will shift up and you will have less losses. So that's one thought. And then on the opposite side, the chart on the far right, a thick circuit, 30 mil thick, if you want to improve your losses there, uh, the thought is not to use a smoother copper. You can, and that will make some difference, but that's really not the dominant factor. The conductor effects is not really what you're trying to adjust. In this case, you would really want to go after the dielectric losses. And uh, again, for a thick circuit, dielectric losses dominate. So in this case, you probably would want to go from 4350B to another material, like maybe RL3003 or CLTEAT or something like that. And those materials have lower dissipation factor, and then you will affect the uh, insertion loss more significantly. So this is kind of what I mean by uh, thickness uh, does have an impact on insertion loss, and the thin circuits at millimeter wave for 5G are going to have a different concern for insertion loss than the thick circuits at sub-6 gigahertz for 5G. And then just to drive the point home a little bit more, um, this is a comparison using the exact same material and it's different thicknesses. So I'm looking at 5 mil thick and 20 mil thick RO3003, and I'm showing the differences due to conductor differences, and the conductor difference is the comparison between ED copper, which has a rough profile, about 2.0 microns RMS, and then a smooth copper, which is rolled copper, which has an average roughness about 0.35 microns RMS. And uh, to look at this chart, the difference between smooth copper on the red curve and rough copper blue curve, that's the thin circuit. We get a difference of about 0.35 dB per inch difference for the thin circuit. The thicker circuit with the exact same comparison, you only get about uh, point, well, I need stronger reading glasses, 0.1 dB per inch difference. So you can see that the 20 mil thick circuit is less sensitive to the difference between rough and smooth copper than the thin circuit. So thinner circuits more sensitive to differences in conductor. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, going along with this, at sub six gigahertz applications, these applications are usually using thicker materials. And what the materials are we're seeing most commonly specified right now for 5G sub, sub six gigahertz is uh, the two materials that I've mentioned here, 30.7 mil RO4730 T3 laminate and the 30 mil 4835 laminate. So for a multilayer construction, uh, the bullet number one there would be 4730 G3, and in some cases, it's a uh, homogeneous type of uh, construction with this and also 4000 prepreg. In other cases, it's a combination of this laminate and then maybe a mid-loss material. And then the other choice would be the second bullet, the uh, 4835 laminate. And there's trade-offs, of course, why one would pick one material over the other. Uh, both these materials are thermal sets, and that means they're pretty friendly to printed circuit board fabrication. A quick comparison between these two materials, and there's obviously a lot more properties to compare, but I just picked a couple. <clears throat> so the design decay for the 4835 uh, compared to the 4730 G3 laminate uh, it was higher, and the 4730 G3 laminate is roughly around 3 dielectric constant. I'm showing the patient factor at two different frequencies, 2.5 gigahertz and 10 gigahertz, just to remind you that the dissipation factor does change with frequency, of course, and higher frequency uh, worse dissipation factor, essentially, with any material, uh, and lower frequency a little bit better. And then copper surface roughness, the 4835 uses a high-profile copper, unless it's low-pro, and then it's very smooth. But uh, anyway, the 4730 G3 is a smoother copper, and that's about 0.9 microns RMS compared to the 4835 2.8 microns RMS. Now, as thick as these materials are for sub 
six gigahertz 5G applications, the copper surface roughness is probably not that big a deal. Uh, it still will help, though. So if you're really trying to get the most uh, bang for the buck out of the material, you probably do want to use the, the smoother copper surface. And then thermal conductivity uh, and thermal management, that can be a pretty big concern. And you can see the 4835 has a thermal conductivity number that's a little bit better than the 4730G3. Uh, both of these are in the range of being pretty good. Actually, the 4835, I'd say, is really good. And normally, my rule of thumb is having thermal conductivity about 0.5 or greater is considered good. So 47G3 is a little lower than that, but still in the range of being pretty good. Looking at insertion loss differences between these two materials, uh, you can see there's differences, obviously. The 4730G3 has the smoother copper, which helps some, but it also has lower dissipation factor. And again, a thick substrate like this, that's really what's going to play out to be the, uh, the more dominant factor for losses. Um, now let's take a look at the uh, millimeter wave range of frequencies for 5G, and that's 28 to 39 gigahertz. And this could also apply to higher frequency as well, of course, but I'm really kind of targeting that range of frequencies right now. Uh, so what we've seen specified for applications uh, for 5G at this band of frequencies are uh, 4 mil 4835 low-pro laminate and also 5 mil RL3003 laminate. So those are the two choices that are usually combined with uh, lower-cost FR4 to make up the total hybrid uh, multilayer. And the uh, 4835 low pro laminate is a thermal set, so it's going to be pretty friendly to pre, uh, PCB fabrication. The RL3003 is a PTFE-based material. It's ceramic filled and has extremely low losses. And that's probably one of the bigger differences between these materials. There is going to be a difference in circuit fabrication, of course, because they're different type of systems. Uh, but the biggest difference here would probably jump out to me to be the lower losses. The RL3003 is much lower losses than the 4835. Uh, low pro. Uh, so just comparing some of those properties real quick between these two materials, the design decay you can see are pretty much different, 3.55 compared to 3. Just patient factor, pretty big difference there. The RL3003 is considered extremely low loss at 0 0.001. And uh, copper surface roughness, the low pro does have a smoother copper. And in this case, being thin circuits used at this range of frequencies, millimeter wave, that low pro copper is a big deal, and uh, that does make a big difference. Also, you get the benefit of uh, higher thermal conductivity, and I just uh, noticed my number on the previous slide of 0 0.69 for RO4835 is not right. It should be right around about 0 0.62. Apologize for that. Uh, anyway, uh, both of these actually are in the range of having good thermal conductivity. Uh, doing a comparison between these for insertion loss, uh, shown here, and I've actually gone out beyond the frequencies that we're talking about today. I went out to 80 gigahertz, but you can see in the range of frequencies we're talking about is about in the middle of this chart, around 30 to 40 gigahertz. And the blue curve is uh, microstrip transmission lines based on 5 mil RL3003 with ED copper. Green curve is 4 mil 4835 low pro. And uh, if you wanted to, you could use the 5 mil RL3003 with rolled copper, which is really smooth. And in that case, if you look at the numbers at 80 gigahertz, the 5 mil 3003 uh, with ED copper at 80 gigahertz is about 2 dB per inch. If you use rolled copper, that makes a big difference on very thin circuits like this. And the insertion loss should drop down to be close to 1, actually a little lower. I think I get an average about 0.9 dB per inch uh, of loss at 80 gigahertz with 5 mil 3003 rolled copper. So that's a quick comparison there. Now for RF simulation, I thought I'd give you some more information for each one of these materials that are being used. And uh, the design DK is given here for the different laminates and at the different frequencies that we're considering today, as well as the dissipation factor. And then for pre prog that's the bottom table of information. And that's a tricky one, to be honest. So I've given some guidance here, and I've given some words below the table of information for a little more guidance. But to be honest with you, if you really want a, a very accurate number, you probably should call a Rogers representative and talk to him in a little more detail. And the reason I say that is because design decay is a circuit property, so it's basically us testing microstrip transmission lines and looking at the phase response difference. And based on that, we extract the decay of the material at that frequency. And it does have circuit properties, and one of them is uh, copper roughness. And copper roughness will make a difference in this design decay. And the, the issue with prepreg is prepreg can be used different from one construction to another. And prepreg, when it's bonded between two etched materials, so it's just uh, at interfaces of, uh, at the bonding interfaces, there is no copper. 
then you could use this number 3.7 for the 4 mil 4450F. However, if there's copper on one side only, like a foil lamination, and just substrate on the other side, that's copper on one side and not the other, and then you get a different effect. And if you have copper on both sides, like we actually test the material in microscript form, that's also a different effect. So uh, the guidance I've given here is uh, generic and pretty good, I think, if you read the details below. But again, if you want something a little more accurate, uh, feel free to contact one of your Rogers representatives and we can walk you through that. Uh, let's talk about some of the constructions themselves that are being specified at 5G. And these are multi-layer constructions. And uh, for sub-6 gigahertz, what we're seeing is uh, mostly uh, constructions that are around 6-layer to 10-layer and actually some higher, 20 and even 22-layer constructions. And uh, most of these constructions are hybrid. There's a couple that are what I'd consider, um, you know, pure construction. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but most of them are hybrid. At the millimeter wave frequencies, all the different stack ups I've seen, they are all hybrids. And they are using a combination of high frequency materials and FR4 is everything I've seen so far. And um, most of these constructions are 10 to 20 layers. And uh, again, everything to date that I've seen anyway, they're all hybrid constructions. And again, hybrid constructions are put together where you're using dissimilar material to make a multilayer. And there's usually uh, several different reasons for doing this. Sometimes you're mixing and matching these materials for different properties where you might be trying to get a better overall CTE of the circuit with one layer having poor CTE but maybe really good electrical performance. And you try to offset that with other materials that have really good CTE. So that's one issue. Uh, there could be a whole bunch of different things that people do to combine materials. But to be honest, in this case for 5G, I think it comes right down to cost, that they're going to use the more expensive um, high-frequency circuit materials where needed, and any of the circuit layers that doesn't need that performance, they're going to use a lower-cost material. Um, so let's look at these uh, constructions a little bit more in a little more detail. Uh, one of the constructions that I've uh, pointed out here for sub-6 gigahertz is the 4835 uh, laminate combined with mid-loss materials. And mid-loss materials for me is usually uh, something that has dissipation factor of maybe 0 0.008 down to 0 0.005, someplace in that range. And uh, we do have mid-loss materials, which is CAPA 438. We released this material a few years ago, and it is uh, actually very similar formulation to 4835. So this mid-loss material CAPA is actually very well formulated to be you know, very compatible to 4835, obviously. It's just, uh, it is a mid-loss material, so it is going to have a little bit higher dissipation factor, about 0 0.005 or so. Then another construction I've seen is 4730G3 combined with 4450F prepreg. And this is what I'd really call a more pure construction because the 4450F prepreg is a 4000 based material, as is the 4730G3. They do have a little bit different filler, but still they have a lot of properties that are very similar, so it makes them very friendly together. So CTE and TCDK, moisture absorption, all these different things are uh, going to be pretty similar between this prepreg and the core. And that can be, you know, very good for reliability issues and fabrication and a lot of things. Then the millimeter wave uh, 5G uh, ranges from 28 gigahertz to 39 gigahertz. Uh, there's three different hybrid constructions that I've seen so far. One of these constructions using a combination of 3003 and combined with 4450T prepreg and also with FR4. Actually, in these applications where I'm talking about 28 to 39 gigahertz, uh, all of them have FR4 mixed with, with uh, the materials I'm showing here. I just didn't show the FR4. And the FR4 obviously is in uh, layers of the circuit where the high frequency um, characteristics are not that important. The RO4450T prepreg is a newer prepreg that we brought to the market. And uh, that's a prepreg we've been working on for a little while and really have it very optimized. And uh, that prepreg is good for a lot of properties. And one of the uh, interesting things about the prepreg is it's available in different thicknesses, whereas our previous 4450 prepregs were available in one thickness. This is available in thicknesses of 3 mil, 4 mil, and 5 mil. So that kind of helps you uh, tailor the uh, circuit construction thickness a little bit better. And then the second construction I've seen is 4835 Low Pro combined with the 4450T prepreg. And this would be, to me, considered a more pure um, multi-layer, even though there's still layers of FR4 mixed in here uh, that I'm not showing in the areas that are not uh, critical to the RF performance. 
And then the uh, other construction at the bottom there, the RL3003 combined with 4835 Low Pro and also using 4450T Pre-Preg and actually, again, FR4 not mentioned. But I think the constructions I've seen there is, um, just for example, I think it's 3003 on top and 4835 Low Pro on bottom and then the other materials in between all that. And that kind of gives you the best of two worlds in some sense. Um, but anyway, that's some of the constructions I've seen so far to date. Now I want to talk about thermal management. <coughs> Excuse me. And to begin with, I thought I'd start off uh, very simple. And really what I've done is just taken this simple thermal model and the formulas right out of a Physics 101 textbook. And I'll show you in the next few slides how this kind of relates to uh, printed circuit boards and how they behave for thermal management. But essentially what I'm showing here on the right is a drawing that is um, really showing how heat flow works, where you have on top a uh, hot reservoir, hot uh, temperature that's fixed, and then on the bottom you have a cold reservoir and you're connected together with some kind of thermal conductor. And the formula is basically set up to where heat flow H is equal to all this stuff, and one of those things is K, thermal conductivity, and then L is the distance between the hot and the cold reservoirs, and then T sub H, T sub C are the temperatures of these hot and cold reservoirs. And then area is actually area between the hot and cold reservoir and the thermal conductor itself. Now how that relates to printed circuit board is uh, kind of shown here, and I've taken a very simple approach with the printed circuit board and just given an example of a microstrip transmission line that's been bonded to a heat sink. And the bonding was done with uh, something I would call TECA, T-E-C-A, standing for Thermally and Electrically Conductive Adhesive. And there's a few assumptions here. One is uh, I'm assuming that the heat is generated at the signal plane, and that's an okay assumption. When you get into details, there's more to it than that. But for what we're doing today, that's probably good enough. And then I'm also assuming that the ground plane of the microstrip circuit is at the same electrical and thermal potential as the heat sink. And um, with that, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. That's good enough for that one. So uh, some of the things to think about for thermal management is uh, you want to increase heat flow. Having higher heat flow, increased heat flow is a good thing. So basically whatever heat's being generated at the signal plane, the substrate's going to act as the thermal conductor in this case, and you want to have more heat flow going from the signal plane to the ground plane and ultimately to the heat sink below. So increasing heat flow is a big deal. That's what you're really going after for thermal management. And uh, one way to do that would be to have higher thermal conductivity, obviously. In the formula, you can see if you increase K, thermal conductivity, you're going to have a good direct increase with uh, heat flow, H. And then also a thinner circuit is going to have a shorter uh, heat flow path, basically, and you will increase the heat flow, too, so that's a good thing. And a wider conductor is going to increase A in the formula to where you have more area between the signal plane and the ground plane, and that also increases heat flow, so that's also a good thing. Um, then material properties improve heat flow. Um, the first topic, actually I probably shouldn't word it that way because insertion loss is not a material property, even though materials do affect insertion loss. But let me talk about that quickly. Uh, and I think most of you already know this, but it's good to go through it anyway. Um, if you have more insertion loss or increased insertion loss in a circuit, you will have more heat generated. And uh, that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about thick and thin circuits for sub six gigahertz a millimeter wave for 5G. So a lower conductor loss for a thinner circuit for the millimeter wave 5G applications is something you should consider because lower conductor losses obviously is gonna mean lower insertion loss. Lower insertion loss means less heat generated. And if you have less heat generated, then you don't have to worry about heat flow quite as much because you have less of it. Uh, and then also lower dissipation factor, that's the thing to think about for the sub six gigahertz 5G applications because uh, the sub-6 gigahertz applications are usually thicker and uh, they're more sensitive to dissipation factor, so you would want to have a lower loss materials for the thicker circuits at sub-6 gigahertz. And then material properties. Uh, high thermal conductivity will increase heat flow. We already talked about that. And I'll give you a chart and some table information in just a little bit. And then lower DK, normally people don't think about dielectric constant associated with thermal management. But there is a benefit there. So if you actually change the design from a higher DK to a lower DK and maintain all the circuit features for impedance and things like that, lower DK will allow you a wider conductor, and a wider conductor means lower conductor losses for one, so you're going to generate less heat. 
And then the other thing is a wider conductor is going to have more area between the signal plane and the ground plane, and that will increase heat flow. Now, of all these different things, uh, actually having higher thermal conductivity is the most important. And that's actually what I'm going to be showing on this slide. And uh, we've done several different thermal models, and of course you can do the same. And you can adjust all the different variables that you're concerned about. But uh, what we found was if you look at very low loss materials and insertion loss, dissipation factor, and different things that come into play, it's really thermal conductivity that is the major player for improving uh, heat flow and also having less heat rise. So really what I'm showing here is a table of information, a chart that goes along with it of different materials that have different uh, loss characteristics, different uh, dissipation factor, and different thermal conductivity. And on the right of the uh, column on the table of information, you can see insertion loss. The RT Duroid 5880 laminate is an extremely low loss material, probably one of the lowest on the market, if not the lowest loss. Just patient factor of 0.0009, and uh, that gives us a pretty low insertion loss. But if you actually look at the heat rise in our models that we ran, you can see that's actually one of the highest. It is the highest for heat rise. Now, all these models were assuming the same thing, and that is a 50 ohm microscript transmission line based on a 30 mil thick circuit, so it is a thick circuit. And we're uh, modeling with the assumption of 250 watts being applied at 2.5 gigahertz. So as you look through the different information in the table and the chart, what you'll find is having low insertion loss is a good thing, of course, because uh, you're generating less heat. But the bigger thing is thermal conductivity, and having higher thermal conductivity is definitely better. So the next um, row down on that table, the RO4350B laminate, you can see that that does not have as good dissipation factor as the RT Duroid 5880, and it does have the higher insertion loss. In fact, of all of them, it has the highest insertion loss, but it does have lower heat rise, which is the uh, y-axis on the left, than does the 5880 materials. So thermal conductivity does make a difference. You can go through the numbers and go through the thought process, but essentially it comes down to if you're going to juggle different properties and materials and you're worried about thermal management, thermal conductivity should be the item that would be of most interest. This is an output of uh, one of the studies that we've done on uh, thermal conductivity and thermal management several years ago. And in this case, this is not RF power being applied. This is a really simple circuit that's a two copper layer circuit that is uh, attached to a heat sink, in this case, a water cooled heat sink. And uh, the circuit had uh, mounted on top of it a um, termination resistor, and then we uh, applied DC current to this resistor to heat it up, basically. And the information on the left is this circuit with the termination resistor being heated up with the amount of uh, DC power on the x-axis and the temperature that we got from this on the y-axis. And the temperature, each one of those data points, is after we applied the DC power and allowed uh, some amount of time to come to a thermal equilibrium then took the uh, temperature of the circuit. And you can see what happens is uh, the green curve, which has the highest temperature rise, is actually a woven glass PTFE material that has, it's considered a low loss material actually, but it does have the highest temperature rise really because the thermal conductivity is the worst. It has a thermal conductivity about 0.25 watts per meter K. And then as you improve the thermal conductivity, the next uh, chart, or the next curve down, I think that's purple it looks like, um, that's the RO4350B laminate, and it's got a thermal conductivity about 0.62 watt per meter K, and an improvement on that would be the 4360G2 laminate that's below that, about 0.8 watt per meter uh, Kelvin, and then below that, the one with the best thermal conductivity, RT Deroid 6035HTC, with a thermal conductivity of 1.44 watts per meter K. And I think that's probably the highest thermal conductivity on the market for an RF material that I know of. Uh, so anyway, obviously thermal conductivity makes a big difference here. And then if you look to the right, I thought I would uh, show something that uh, many designers try to implement. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, depending on the configuration of the chip and the circuit. And that is via farms. So via farm is basically a lot of plated troll vias sitting right underneath the chip that's generating the heat. And uh, these via farms, these copper vias, are going to act as a very good thermal path to the ground plane below and ultimately the heat sink. So copper has a thermal conductivity that's really good, about 400 watts per meter K, and maybe even a little bit higher than that, but it's extremely good. So having copper pedestals, so to speak, underneath the chip that's generating heat is about as good as it's going to get. 
Now, of course, depending on the design of that chip, you can't short that out. Uh, so maybe these pedestals are only in isolated areas of that chip where there's grounding, or in some cases, you can't do this completely. And if that's true, my next slide might be a little bit more helpful. And this is testing microstrip transmission lines. In this case, this is RF power being applied, and I applied 85 watts at 3.3 gigahertz. And on the left, I'm showing a top view with my thermal imaging camera looking straight down on the signal conductor after it has come to a thermal equilibrium, taking a snapshot there. And I'm getting a maximum temperature about 123 degrees C. And using the exact same material except a different circuit design on the right, I'm using grounded coplanar waveguide, I'm only getting about 104 degrees. Oh, sorry, F. So these temperatures are in F, 123F on the chart on the left, microstrip, and 120 or 104F for the um, picture on the right. And the picture on the right is a grounded coplanar waveguide, but it's loosely coupled. So I also did experiments with different coupling, moderate coupling and very tightly coupled. And what I found was you get less benefit when you go tightly coupled. And the reason why, on a grounded coplanar waveguide, if you look at the differences of losses between loosely coupled and tightly coupled, the tightly coupled grounded coplanar waveguide will actually have higher losses due to conductor losses, and then you're actually generating more heat. Even though you've got a better heat flow path, you actually um, don't get quite the benefit as you would if you use a loosely coupled grounded coplanar waveguide. And really what's happening in the case of this loosely coupled uh, grounded coplanar waveguide is there's heat being generated at the signal plane. Some of that heat's going directly in the z-axis straight down to the ground plane below and ultimately the heat sink. But some of it is actually going laterally, left and right, of the signal conductor. There are neighboring ground planes that have uh, very good uh, conductors for thermal conductors, and that's these uh, vias. So there is a row of these vias on both sides of the uh, signal conductor, and whatever heat's being generated laterally can be picked up on these neighboring ground planes, and the heat can flow more effectively to the ground plane below. So this idea is called a thermal fence, and uh, sometimes this is a good thing to do, and uh, I thought I'd give you that for a reference. Uh, there's another issue that comes up with thermal management that a lot of people don't think about, and that is the final plated finish. Uh, most certainly can have an impact on thermal management. And here what I've done, again, using my thermal imaging camera, I've uh, designed and built some filters on 20 mil RO4003C laminate, and the only difference between these two pictures are one circuit is based on bare copper, no finish, no solder mask, nothing, just bare copper circuit on the left. And the circuit on the right is exactly the same material, same everything, except it has ENIG plated on the copper. ENIG is the electrolytic nickel immersion gold, and it does cause more conductor losses, especially in this case where it is a microstrip hairpin bandpass filter and it's got edge coupling. And that edge coupling makes it more problematic for a lossy plated finishes. Uh, at this case, also, I was testing uh, with RF power 25 watts and in the center of the pass band of these filters, about 3.3 gigahertz. And you can see there's a pretty remarkable difference in the temperature. Uh, so this, again, is after I've allowed the circuits to come to a thermal equilibrium. And the temperature for the bare copper circuits on the left, I get a 152F. And the temperature with the exact same circuit, same design, same everything, except ENIG plated on the right, 262F. So that's a pretty big difference in temperature just due to plated finish only. Now, this is 20 mil thick. If you imagine a thinner circuit that's even more sensitive to conductor effects, which plated finish is affecting, then these numbers would probably be even more different where the filter with the ENEG is even going to be higher temperature. So final plated finishes, I'll go through that on this slide and the next couple of slides quickly because I think that's pretty important. Um, the final plated finishes do have an impact on conductor loss. And of course, the thinner circuits are more impacted by conductor loss than thicker circuits. So for the uh, millimeter wave band of frequencies at 5G, uh, considering final plate of finishes would be a smart thing to do. The lower frequency, sub six gigahertz, that's gonna be less impacted by the plated finish uh, for a few reasons. And one of them is plated finish is also uh, frequency dependent to where uh, due to skin depth, you would use more or less of the plated finish. And at lower frequencies, you usually have less losses due to the final plated finish than you do at higher frequency. So it's kind of uh, two different issues there. One is thickness. A thicker circuit is not affected by the conductor or the plated finish as much. And then frequency also matters. Higher frequency have more losses, lower frequency less losses. So um, 
I think I said everything on that slide, so we'll move on to the next one. And uh, here's a comparison, uh, just kind of driving the point a little bit more. And this is kind of similar to what I did uh, several slides back, comparing the same materials, same design, same everything, except just two different conductor effects. And in this case, the conductor effects is bare copper versus ENIG, electric nickel immersion gold. And it's the same material. In this case, it is RO4003C laminates. And I have thinner laminates, 8 mil thick, and thicker laminates, 20 mil thick. These are all 50 ohm microstrip transmission lines. And I'm really showing that the thinner circuit is more impacted by the difference between bare copper and ENIG than the thicker circuit. So the thinner circuit, 8 mil thick, bare copper is the green curve. Also, the uh, purple curve is with the thinner circuit, 8 mil thick, but that's with ENIG. And the difference there between bare copper and ENIG is about 0.38 dB per inch difference. That same comparison on a thicker substrate, 20 mil thick, you get a 0.21 dB per inch difference. And that is the blue curve, 20 mil thick bare copper, and red curve, 20 mil thick with ENIG. So thickness does definitely matter, and a thinner circuit is going to be more affected by these uh, conductor effects due to the plated finish. And uh, move on to this slide. This is actually just showing a little bit more information about different plated finishes. It's a study that we did several years ago. And uh, again, it's comparing bare copper to other plated finishes. The test vehicle is really important when you do this kind of a study. And what I did for test vehicle was uh, a worst case scenario to really see differences of these plated finishes. So knowing plated finishes affect conductor losses, the right test vehicle to use would be a very thin circuit that is also very low loss and also using very smooth copper. That way, whatever differences I see are going to be related more to the uh, conductor effects due to the plated finish itself. So for this, the reference, or as good as it gets type of curve, would be the bare copper curve, which is the light blue curve. There's a couple other curves I left blue purposely, too, because they're pretty much behaving the same for insertion loss, and there's really not a significant difference in insertion loss between the bare copper curve and also the circuits had OST and immersion silver. OST stands for organic solderability preservative. It's usually considered to be a temporary covering of the copper. It's got a shelf life, I think maybe three to six months, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's temporary. Immersion silver is a permanent plated finish, and it really does not cause any differences in insertion loss compared to a bare copper circuit. And then after that, solder mask, and I'll talk about that more in a, a, a minute or so. Uh, solder mask is not affecting conductor losses, by the way. That's actually affecting dielectric losses. Uh, immersion 10 is what I see a lot at millimeter wave applications. The millimeter wave applications I've been working with for the last several years are really more at 77 gigahertz for uh, automotive radars, but it still applies here at the frequency range we're talking about uh, in the uh, millimeter wave range of 5G, uh, and I am seeing more of the immersion 10 in those applications as well. Anypig is also used sometimes, and ENIG is also used throughout the industry a lot. Actually, ENIG is a really good plated finish. It's just that the uh, designer needs to account for the losses associated with ENIG. As long as that's accounted for, that's fine. It is a good finish, uh, but it's obviously going to have much more losses. Now, my comment about solder mask, and I debated putting that in here, and I, the more I think about it, I probably shouldn't. Uh, but at one time, I was thinking, well, it might be a good thing to look at the difference between solder mask and these other finishes because sometimes a designer could use solder mask to protect the copper instead of the finish and see what the trade-off is. Unfortunately, uh, solder mask is very high in moisture absorption, and I tested this in a very dry climate here in Chandler, Arizona. And if I would have tested solder mask, the same circuit, the solder mask in uh, Singapore or Houston or someplace much more humid, uh, I'm sure this curve would dive down a lot. In fact, it'd probably be worse than the ENIG curve. So that's one issue to think about. Another thing is solder mask will vary in thickness from one circuit to another. So you do get more circuit-to-circuit -circuit variation with solder mask. Uh, also, all solder masks are not created the same. Some solder masks have more loss than others. Uh, in general, acrylic-based solder masks are a little lower losses than epoxy-based but they're still pretty bad when you look at dissipation factor, where solder mask usually has dissipation factor about 0.02, maybe 0.025, even higher. So the solder mask comparison, I debate putting that in there. I did anyway, but if you are considering that, make sure you realize there's a lot more variables, and it could be worse than what's shown here. I think that's about it for this presentation, and it leaves me a few minutes for questions.
Great presentation, John. Thank you very much. So first question, can you recommend a, a book or other resources for an introduction to this subject? Yeah, boy, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, I went through multiple topics here, and I can't think of one book that actually addresses a lot, to be honest. Uh, one of my favorite books for microwave in general and does address some millimeter wave issues is Microwave Engineering from David Posar. I really like that book. So it really does cover a lot of these different topics. And it does cover microwave issues and some millimeter wave issues, but it does not get much into thermal management. And then when it comes to thermal management, um, well, I can't think of a good book on the market right now for thermal management uh, for printed circuit boards. I'm sure there are. I just haven't been exposed to it. So I apologize. I don't have a good response for that one. No problem. And you have a bunch of videos in your support hub, too, that address all these different subjects. Oh, yeah. Thanks. The next question, next question um, why is uh, RT-Dorade 5880 not suitable for 5G? Uh, a few things. One is uh, 5880 is a fantastic material for very low losses. It's a low DK, which means it could be really good for radiating elements of antennas. There's a lot of good things about 5880, but it's like everything. You've got trade-offs. And 5880 does have a very high CTE, so if you're using that in a multilayer, uh, that can be problematic for plated through-hole reliability and things like that. If it's a thin layer of 5880 and millimeter wave, that may not be bad because a thin layer of 5880 that has a poor CTE combined with other materials in the hybrid multilayer that have good CTE, that might be a good way to go, to be honest. Um, I didn't recommend it here just because there's these what-ifs and uh, different trade-offs, but 5880 is really not a bad option. It's just you got to be careful. I would not use that at sub-6 gigahertz because that's usually a thicker substrate, and 5880 went thicker you have more concern with the CTE. A thinner a millimeter wave, that might be a smart way to go, to be honest. The circuit fabrication side of 5880 is more uh, difficult, basically, because it is um, PTFE-based, and it's also uh, very highly PTFE-based as a percentage. It's a pretty high percentage of PTFE, and that makes the circuit fabrication a little bit more tricky. You can certainly do it in multilayers. It's been done for years and years, but you just have to be a little more careful about it. Okay, next question. Is there a lower conduction loss um, with the thicker substrates, or is that more of a consequence of the wider trace? Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, the conductor loss is related to the copper only and not the substrate, but it is a thickness relationship. So as the copper planes are moved closer together in the case of a thin circuit, then these copper planes are going to dominate the wave properties much more. In the case of a thick circuit, when the copper planes are moved farther apart, then the copper planes and their effects are much less. So it's not really that the substrate is behaving any different due to conductor effects of the copper thin or thick. It's just that the effects of the copper itself are more significant when they're, the copper planes are very close together in the case of a thin circuit as compared to a thick circuit. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. If the design DK accounts for the copper surface roughness, should you specify the roughness in the simulation material definition? Um, that's a good question, too, and I hesitate because when you get into copper surface roughness, it really gets tricky when you get into details. And what I mean by that is uh, copper surface roughness, like all things, has normal variation. So the copper surface uh, roughness for the RO3003 is, uh, on average, 2.0 microns RMS. However, if you measure multiple places on the sheet of copper, you will see differences. And if you look at uh, lots of lot variation, you're going to see differences. So the copper surface roughness that we're specifying, or that we're talking about anyway, uh, of 2.0 microns RMS uh, for 2003, that's an average number. So it is going to vary up and down. And the trick is on one circuit, uh, let's say a two copper layer circuit, You've got a signal plane and a ground plane, and due to that normal variation, the copper surface roughness on the signal plane is not going to be the same copper surface roughness on the ground plane. They're probably going to be close, but just due to that variation, they are going to be different. And uh, there's a lot of reasons not to specify roughness on the, um, the print, I think, just because there's so many different um, variables that come into play when you really get into the details. Uh, you could, I, I suppose you could just specify low profile copper or something like that. IPC has different definitions for profile copper. Probably could do something like that. 
but as for an exact number, that would be difficult because it's also very difficult to measure that too, especially if you've already clad the laminate. So on a copper clad laminate, if you try to remove the copper and measure the roughness, just in the fact of removing the copper, you're going to affect the roughness and you won't get an me accurate measurement. Also, if you try to measure copper roughness in a micro section, that's just a snapshot of one point, and then as you grind down farther in the micro section, you're going to get a different number. And it's also going to be different on the signal plane and the ground plane. So, sorry about the long story, but uh, that's kind of a tricky one. It's one of those things on the surface seems like a smart thing to do, but when you get into details, it's really hard to implement that and make sense of it. Okay, next question. Could you comment on other reasons for design DK being different from process DK? Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I've got several things on list on a Rogers Technology Support Hub, and I invite people to take a look at those because that can do a lot better justice than I can in just a few minutes. Uh, but really what it is is we, what we found was um, when we test our uh, materials in uh, raw form here at our manufacturing site, we basically make the materials, etch off all the copper, put it into a clamp fixture, clamp it all together, and test it as a clamp strip line. So it's ground signal ground, the strip line resonator. And we're testing the raw material itself, so there's really not circuit properties there. But also, as a clamping fixture, you have entrapped error, and error is a low dielectric constant. So the process decay that we get by testing the raw materials does have some influence of error being entrapped in that fixture, and it's going to report a lower number than it would if you actually had a fully laminated circuit with not error. So that's one issue. Another thing is uh, if you make that same material in circuit form and test it like a microstrip transmission line, we have found uh, the difference of copper surface roughness will make a difference on the phase velocity. And for just very simple electromagnetics, a slower wave is perceived by the circuit as a higher dielectric constant. And uh, what happens is when the copper is rough, it will slow the wave down. And even though the substrate is the same, with a, with a circuit using smooth and rough copper, the circuit with the smooth copper will perceive a faster wave and it will report a higher dielectric constant when you extract the dielectric constant from the circuit performance than a circuit using rough copper that will slow the wave down. So there's quite a story here too, and as you go thicker, then the effects of the copper doesn't matter as much as it does when it's thinner. And again, we have some videos and some papers on a Rogers Technology Support Hub that can get in a lot more detail, and it really should be looked into if uh, someone has questions. Okay, next question. Does gold plating make a difference in the insertion loss? Uh, gold by itself, no. Uh, but there's usually a barrier between the copper and the gold, and that's nickel, and that usually does. And um, the reason nickel does is a couple. One is nickel is about one quarter or one third the conductivity of copper, so nickel has less conductivity. And um, that's one thing. Also, nickel is ferromagnetic, and it does have some amount of magnetic losses. And to be honest with you, I really don't know what to think of that because nickel used in ENIG, electric nickel immersion gold, is not pure nickel. It's actually an alloy. And depending on how that alloy is made, it could be better or worse for ferromagnetics. But either way, uh, nickel is less conductive than copper. And um, really what you get from a microstrip circuit, most of the fields are between the signal plane and the ground plane, but at the edges, there is high current density. And at the edges, that's where the nickel uh, actually causes more conductor losses. And so there has to be this barrier between the copper and the gold to make sure that these copper oxides don't migrate through the gold to the surface and corrupt the gold. So that barrier is usually nickel, and nickel is usually what causes the losses. If you just plate gold right on top of copper, you really don't see much difference, because I have done that. There's a very slight difference, but hardly detectable, to be honest. OK, next question. Have you done any conformal coding studies on the loss for thermal management issues? Um, I guess I'll say no, because um, I have done studies a few years ago, and uh, one of them was using a sputtered process that was uh, parvulene, and I don't know if that's really considered conformal coding or not, but that really had no difference on insertion loss, um, from my study anyway, and since there's no difference on insertion loss, I'm assuming there would be no difference in heat generated. So in general, I don't think it has a significant impact for the parolene that I evaluated. I think it's parolene C. Uh, but outside of that, I really don't, and that was also a very limited study, by the way, so that's, you know, very limited information. Outside of that, I really don't have anything else on that topic. 
Okay, next question. Can you um, repeat the name of the simulation software that you mentioned? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the simulation software that does the comparison of insertion loss and breaks out insertion loss and components of dielectric loss and conductor loss. That's uh, a free download from a website called MWI 2018, and uh, that will do impedance modeling and also loss prediction for simple transmission lines that are microstrip and strip line and things like that. Next question is, uh, why do you use the thinner substrate for millimeter wave applications? Yeah, that's a really good good question, and there's a bunch of reasons. Um, one is, um, boy, radiation is one of them. So as you go to a thicker substrate, you get more energy radiated off the circuit, and um, a thinner circuit will have less radiation. And radiation is frequency dependent too. At lower frequencies, circuits do not want to radiate as much as higher frequencies. So as you go to higher frequencies, if you do that with a thick microstrip circuit, you're going to have more losses due to radiated energy, and that radiated energy has to go somewhere, so it can corrupt uh, as EMI neighboring components. So a thin circuit helps the, the circuit not radiate as much at higher frequencies. Um, another thing would be um, uh, wave propagation modes. So normally, like on a microstrip circuit, you want to have a quasi-TEM wave. TEM is transverse electromagnetic. And um, as you get to higher frequencies, you get more things that can happen. In a very simple sense, you can have resonances build up. And if the, the thickness of the substrate is such that between the signal plane and the ground plane, if that distance happens to be a half wavelength, then you just create a really good resonator. It's going to resonate a whole bunch of energy, and it's going to corrupt the wave that you do want to move down the transmission line. And that's one problem. Uh, but you can also have a resonance due to the width of the signal conductor itself, where you can have a wave bouncing back and forth acting as a resonator there. And that also can corrupt the, um, the transmission line wave properties. And this corruption is actually a spurious wave mode in some sense, I guess. Uh, so anyway, if you go thinner, that means the concern that the resonance between the signal plane and the ground plane is less, because now the dimension is smaller, so you would have to go to a much higher frequency to cause that resonance. And then also, as you go thinner to maintain uh, some impedance, you go to a more narrow conductor, and a more narrow conductor is also going to not have a resonance until you get to much higher frequencies. And there is a bunch of other reasons, too. But in general, uh, thin circuits uh, really need to be uh, used at millimeter wave frequencies, with the exception of SIW, Substrate Integrated Waveguide. I have seen that used at millimeter wave frequencies with pretty thick materials, 20 mil thick, 30 mil thick at 60 gigahertz. And if it's done right, you really can do that. But normal uh, microstrip or ground to planar waveguide transmission lines or even strip line um, just by the nature of resonances and spurious modes and things like that, you really do need to have a thinner substrate at millimeter wave frequencies. Okay, next question. Which substrate is recommended for KU band high power discrete GAN power amplifier design? I guess a thermal uh, issue. I'm, I'm sorry, say that again. I didn't catch all that. Uh, what substrate would you recommend for a KU band high power discrete GAN power amplifier design? Hmm. Well, you know, I'd strongly go towards 4835 uh, laminate and maybe even 4835 low pro because 4835 is used and formulated to be used in applications that are generating a lot of power and it has extremely good uh, long term thermal properties. So the 4835 um, acts a lot like the 4350B. It's very similar in formulation, except 4835 is formulated to have really good uh, properties over a long term as a lot of power or heat is generated. Because what happens with most substrates, any thermal set substrate, by the way, will actually change over some period of time when held at an elevated temperature. And what happens is the substrate oxidizes, and that oxidation changes the dielectric constant sum, and it changes the dissipation factor, making it worse. So if you have a material that is a thermal set and you've uh, got long-term uh, higher temperatures being applied, you really need to have uh, a material that's very good for dealing with that. And the 4835 or the 4835 low pro would both be very good candidates. And the reason I bring up low pro would be um, insertion loss related. So 4835 is going to give you pretty good insertion loss, but <clears throat> if you want to have even better insertion loss, I'd use the 4835 low pro 
with the smoother copper, and that's going to help some. Great. I think we've got through most of the questions and hit our time limit here. So, John, thank you very much for a great presentation and Rogers Corporation for sponsoring today's webinar. You can find out more about their products at their website, and they also have a very good support hub with all kinds of information. This webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch it about an hour from now. You can find it in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. If your colleagues would benefit from watching it, please let them know. And we thank everybody for joining us today.